Welcome to the IoT Podcast, the home of IoT talks and tales. I'm your host this week, Tom White. Tune in every Monday as we're joined by the biggest names in IoT to unravel the trends, misconceptions, and predictions for the Internet of Things. Make sure you're subscribed and press the notification bell so you're never out of the loop. Hi guys, before we get into the episode today, I wanted to give a shout out to our sponsor, Akenza IO. Akenza IO are a self-service IoT platform allowing you to build great IoT products and services with real value. Welcome to the IoT podcast, Ben. Hi, nice to be here. Good to have you here. Um, so for those that don't know you, i um, just going to dive straight into it. So you haven't always been in IoT, Ben. Um, originally worked at a business called Food Panda. Could you explain a little bit about that and what that is to our listeners? Yeah, for sure. I mean, so I, I think it's probably just a good opportunity for me to sort of explain how I ended up doing this. Um, so Food Panda is an online food delivery business. Uh, when I started there, uh, which I guess was probably over 10 years ago now, um, you know, we opened up the Singapore market, uh, started expanding through Southeast Asia. And, um, you know, part of what we needed to do was be able to have really efficient operations. Uh, and that meant trying to find a way to deliver orders directly to the restaurants without having a call center. Uh, so we built a little GPRS printer um, and this used cellular connectivity uh, in order to do it. You can imagine like a little credit card terminal looking thing that would print out um, an order. Um, and, um, you know, it, I just remember it was it was really challenging to build, um, really challenging to get connectivity, really challenging to get it to work across multiple geographies, limited software and tooling. Uh, and so I kind of didn't think much of it at the time, but filed, the, filed that away in the back of my brain um, and eventually uh, moved back to the United States uh, where I looked to start a business. Uh, and... That was, you know, 2013 or so when IoT was really kind of like a, you know, a much talked about thing, you know, big in, in the hype cycle. Uh, I, I felt that folks, you know, were, were, were missing the thread a little bit in the sense that there was a lot of focus on smart home and wearables, which is, you know, certainly an important part of IoT. Um, and that certainly has panned out, you know, there's connected devices everywhere in your home. Um, but really what we're talking about is this idea of, you know, when the internet started, you're connecting computers to computers, then you're connecting mobile phones and tablets. And then finally you're connecting the physical world in order to do that. You need cellular connectivity. Um, and, um, that's how we ended up, uh, building hologram. So, uh, you know, remember put two and two together, uh, from, uh, my experience seeing the challenges at, at food panda, um, and then ultimately, uh, decided to do something about it, um, and, uh, build a unified way for, for folks to connect devices anywhere um, and uh, do so with really, really good software and tooling. Um, so it's really suitable for building uh, IoT applications at scale. Yeah, I think I think that's fantastic. It's such a lovely story. And I, I remember talking to you about that um, off air when we were doing our discovery call. And I think that's, for me, the definition of an entrepreneur is to work in one industry, to spot a problem, the, a big issue. And to use that as a segue into into a new market, uh, and that's exactly what you did, right? You know, and and you know, you you had an issue with Food Panda, as you said, uh, about being able to to get real time updates to the drivers without having to go through a centralized system. Um, and that and and did that kind of spur on, and did that was that the main kind of precursor to to building what is now Hologram? Then, yeah, more or less. I mean, you know, look, it it, it was definitely. Um... Yeah, I mean, more or less, you know, I think I've also always been a really big believer in, you know, building businesses in really big markets. Um, and I think that, you know, when you think about the connected device market, um, it's something that is likely to, you know, continue growing just kind of forever. Um, there's, there's really never going to be a point in time where we're not connecting more things to the internet. Um, and so, so, so those 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 were sort of the, some of the key decision points around deciding to start hologram. Excellent, yeah. And and uh, for our listeners, then, so kind of boilerplate uh, kind of version of what hologram is and what it does. How long have you guys been around? What's the mission statement of the business? Yeah, so we've uh, been around since uh, late 2013, so uh, about 10 years or so. 
Uh, and you know, our, our mission is to empower innovators to build the future uh, anywhere. Uh, and you know, we do that um, by providing cellular connectivity uh, for devices uh, and software for the people uh, who build those devices to manage them. Uh, you know, if I was to explain it to um, you know so someone who had no familiarity with um, with IoT, I would say, you know, we 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 provide phone plans for things that aren't phones, uh, and <laughs> uh, and that's and that, that that's sort of the simplistic version, right? Um, but <laughs> at, at its core, you know, we're 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 really making sure that you can have performant connectivity anywhere in the world. Increasingly, with our new launch of uh, next generation of our hypersim, you know, we're giving you access to native tier one carriers with with native fallback and things like that. Um, so it's a little more complicated than just phone plans for things that aren't phones, but at its core, you know, the connecti- connectivity is the DNA of what we do um, mm. and making sure hardwares are online and making sure that your hardware is always online. Um, and then we've built a lot of software and tooling around that to manage your deployments, which becomes increasingly important as you scale. Yeah. It's, it's funny when you, when you gave that example of, providing phone plans for things that are phones. Uh, it always reminds me of kind of chat GPT because there's so many prompts out there at the moment where it's kind of like, you know, explain this if I was a five-year-old or explain this if I didn't know anything about anything. And I actually think there's a real art to doing that, you know, to explain stuff in so simple terms. Um, uh, but it always makes me smile when, when someone uh, explains it something in that, in that manner. Um, so uh, hologram, obviously, Obviously, cellular provider for IoT, uh, you know, for the benefit of, of our listeners and, and for myself as well, can, can you explain a little bit about the technology and why that is different or not readily accessible from traditional cellular providers, Ben? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, there's really kind of two key ways that you can connect um, in the IoT world. And really, this is true for consumers as well. You know, one is, you know, what you're probably most familiar with, which is you're going to have a direct sort of line to a singular telco. Um, so, you know, where you know, the United States is going to be, you know, you know, um, you know T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, uh, you know, cellular, uh, you know, there's a bunch of regional carriers, uh, you know, some MVNOs like Cricket and stuff like that, right? Um, and, uh, you know, if you're elsewhere in the world, it's going to be different carriers. But either way, you're going to have sort of, you know, one operator that is your you know, primary home operator. Um, and that's going to give you really good performance sort of where you are. Um, uh, generally speaking, you know, a lot of times you know, people will pick that operator based on where they live and where the, you know, the coverage is strongest. When you travel, they're going to have some form of roaming agreements, which are going to be, um, you know, have varying degrees of, of are going to be, you know, varying degrees of good, I guess, for, 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 for what you need. Um, but that's but at, at the end of the day, it's really kind of meant for someone who's like kind of in a fixed area, right? Um, yeah. And um, now, importantly, you get really, really good performance like that, um, and you get really good pricing too. Uh, generally speaking, as a consumer, um, but when you think about IoT devices, not only are they moving around, either they're moving around or they're being deployed to fixed locations, and you don't necessarily know what coverage is going to exist when you get there. Uh, and so, it becomes increasingly important to have access to multiple operators. Now, you can do that through roaming. Um, and so, um, one of the ways that, you know, you've probably seen like, if you've, you know, traveled around, right, you probably see like travel sims or things like that, right, which mm-hmm. are, are really indexed on sort of that roaming market. It's like, oh, well, if you're going to be in Greece and then you're going to be in Spain, you know, you can use this sim card and it's going to provide you with good rates. Roaming mm-hmm. is going to be useful. Um, ro- roaming tends to be more expensive, less performant, um, but it, it, provides you, know, you coverage kind of wherever you are, um, which is really, really mm. helpful. Um, and so what we've done, and especially with what we're, you know, sort of rolling out now, we've kind of combined the, the best of both worlds here. So we're, we're, we're giving, you know, with some, you know, kind of proprietary technology, uh, both on SIM and, you know, throughout the, the stack, um, you know, we're able to kind of give you access to sort of that performance and latency um, and, you know, high data throughput uh, of native operators, um, and also do so in a way that gives you fallback onto multiple carriers. Um, so you have redundant coverage, um, and you, um, and, you know, if you, if the device is moving around, it's going to have access wherever it needs to be. Uh, so, mm-hmm. so that's, that's sort of the core difference, uh, between what you're seeing in something like hologram versus just sort of you're going directly 
to you know your local operator and buying a, a SIM card for your phone. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's really topical for me personally. And then to bring this back down into into uh, telling telling it to a five year old by chat GPT terms, um, I, I I was in Florida um, and uh, I had to buy some data, I had to buy a bundle, and the price I paid or was offered was like sixty dollars for a gigabyte from my from my UK network, right? Whereas I used, I think it was Air Air Erlo was, uh, was a certain device. Um, I bought it at a fraction of the cost, right? And um, and you and you, and you got to think from from a consumer point of view that was okay because I was on a phone. But from a device, a device device can't necessarily make that choice, right? And the device could be there, as you say, the device. Uh, could be in situ for a number of years or could be constantly roaming or could be where, uh, elsewhere. And so this, this is the necessity for this in, in order to have this to happen. This, this constant need of, of updates and over the air updates and kind of agnostic really to where it roams and where it goes. So, um, absolutely critical for the success of IoT and critical for, uh, for cellular, um, onto IoT to enable this to happen. Um, so it's a great, it's a great, it's a great introduction and a great business model. A um, lot of talk out there online around uh, uh, iSIM, eSIM, ver- different versions, etc. In your own words, what what's the difference between an iSIM and an eSIM, Ben? It's a great, great question. So you know the the terminology uh, for this stuff can kind of be messy sometimes. Like folks tend to so people will say eSIM when they really mean EUICC. Um, or, you know, ISIM when they really mean ESIM, whatever, et cetera. So, so like, but the, the way that I see it and, you know, you know, I'm, the way I see it, um, and I, I, I think this is accurate at least, <laughs> uh, is, uh, that UICC, um, is really what we talk about when we talk about having multiple profiles on a single SIM card. And that's sort of the technology that underpins what, what people typically are calling ESIM. Um, so that means you have a single SIM card that's capable of accessing multiple operators programmatically. Um, and there's a specific standard, a specific GSMA standard around that. Multi-MZ is a different thing um, as well. Uh, Multi-MZ is not eSIM. Um, and the core difference is multi-MZ is sort of like programmable. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, different, it's a different thing where you're basically, you have profiles versus having um, sort of like a true native operator SIM switching paradigm. Um, yeah. And so multi-MZ tends to be, it, it, it can work for redundancy, but it, it, it's tricky and it, it, it has trouble with devices, um, with certain devices. It's, it's not going to be consistent performance across devices. Um, and that can result in downtime. Um, so, so there's, so, so I would, I would split it into kind of like multi-MZ, EUICC. Um, you know, we feel personally that EUICC is kind of the superior paradigm if you can, have the software around it to enable redundancy, which is one of the big benefits of multi MZ. ISIM now is really kind of uh, my understanding of it, and I think it's it, it's kind of still nascent and evolving. Um, is um, it's very similar to eSIM or EUICC, uh, except it's now being embedded on a module, so you you don't have necessarily a physical mm. SIM card. Um, you have uh, just the code snippet. Uh, that it because because each SIM card is running like a little Java applet basically, so you're mm-hmm. actually running code on the SIM card. Um, instead of running that on a SIM card, you're running on like a secure hardware module that is embedded within the SIM, and that, that that's that's my understanding. Like when I say iSIM, that's what I would refer to. Um, mm-hmm. And um, and so uh, that's interesting because you know I, I think it kind of you said something really interesting a minute ago, which was you know, your SIM card or a device can't really make decisions about purchasing coverage in certain places. Um, and that's one of the key differentiators, I think, between, you know, again, sort of a consumer facing application versus something that's built for IoT is, you know, we're able to programmatically make decisions or give you, you know, tools to basically programmatically make decisions around network selection uh, over time. And, and right now you need a physical SIM card, generally speaking, to do that. Over time, mm-hmm. I think a uh, you know, I think it's really interesting that, you know, you can start to move to a place where, um, you know, more and more of this can be software. Um, that, that's, that's a really, really cool thing. Um, especially because I think it makes it easier to embed connectivity into things if more and more of it can be software. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. And I also think that, you know, the, 
the emergence of um, removing the, the hardware nature of a SIM card is a good one. The world's moving more software defined um, for an actual device, uh, you know, not needing to actually physically have a card in there, which, as you say, runs on a Java app anyway, kind of makes sense, right? Um, and it, it, I think it's only a good thing that we that we go down that path um, and, and continue to evolve it, um, especially from a kind of um, – agnostic point of view and being able to switch carrier quite quickly and um from a software context as opposed to to it being locked into to anything physical um it brings me on quite nicely actually to the current state of iot global connectivity uh, lots of opportunities uh, some challenges uh, what are you seeing at the moment with uh, both of those key topics are you, are you seeing more opportunities are you seeing more challenges at the moment uh, within the confines of hologram yeah, I mean, you know, I think, um, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, look, I think it's, I, I see a lot of opportunities um, in general. I, I think that, you know, as the market has evolved over time, people have gotten much more comfortable building their own connected hardware, um, which I think is a huge, huge part of this. Um, you know, when we first started, right, you know, we actually used to build hardware ourselves. We had kind of a developer platform. Um, and that was kind of necessary because it was still very much, um, you know, it was kind of a nascent space where people just didn't really even know how to build connected devices, um, or, you know, that knowledge wasn't widespread. You know, you had certain companies that were better, you know, maybe, maybe companies that have been in the vending machine space or the POS space, um, or something like that have been doing it forever. Like ATMs are connected, you know, IoT devices, right? People don't really think about that. Um, but, but, you know, it was still kind of a rarefied skill set. I think increasingly as we're seeing people embrace the ability to create devices that will, you know, impact their business in really meaningful ways, whether that's driving efficiencies or new product lines um, or customer experiences, you know, you, you, we're seeing that, you know, there's a lot, it's, it's easier for folks to get a device off the ground. Um, and that I think is ultimately good for the IoT and the connectivity space. I mean, some of the challenges I think we've, had in the past, you know, just around customer enablement and just, you know, getting people connected. You know, look, I think navigating, you know, we're talking about the connectivity landscape in general. Um, you know, I think navigating that is always challenging, right? You know, there's, um, you know, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of operators in the world. Um, they all have networks um, of varying quality um, and varying coverage. Um, the economics are always changing. Um, you know, sometimes there's political factors depending on what country you're in, especially, you know, in, in challenging countries abroad. Uh, and, you know, th that means that, you know, it's up to us, right, to make sure that, you know, we always have a solution uh, for our customers that works, that's redundant. Um, and we kind of take the pain out of that, right? So, so I, I think, you know, insofar as there are challenges just around being able to provide really, you know, good connectivity anywhere in the world. A, you know, at a at a good price that's very very performant. You know, that's sort of like the core of why we exist, um, and um, that's just a constantly evolving space. You know, the opportunities uh, there though are every network. You know, uh, to some extent at least um, that, that we work with, right, is is continuing to upgrade their networks and moving more towards five G. Uh, and I think five G is a huge opportunity for IoT in the long run. I think we're still a couple years out um, before we start seeing. You know, the, the modules that are going to, like right now, all the 5G modules are going into phones. We still have a few years before they start making their, making their way to IoT devices. And they, they use a lot of power and so and they're expensive. So they're not going to be right for every application. But I think what's really exciting is that you start to, you can start to imagine a world where cellular is providing connectivity, um, you know, full stop, right? You know, instead of, you know, it, it starts to become more a part of, uh, it starts to become, Devices that you would normally use Wi-Fi, you're starting to use cellular, um, mm. and I think that's I think that's pretty exciting uh, for for us for for, for you know because our that's our bread and butter. Yeah, yeah, no, I, absolutely. I think I think that's a good good overview, um, and we see that a lot in terms of you know, if we talk about use cases uh, that the connected printer, for instance, right? You know, so um, you know that used to be on a Wi-Fi network, and now you kind of see some printers actually on cellular network and it actually being a little bit easier to have a private cellular network than on Wi-Fi. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people talk about 
and, and this is a really interesting point that you made here around emergence of 5G onto IoT devices. So uh, traditionally speaking, IoT devices are uh, low-cost, low-power devices sending small amounts of information but could be mission critical depending on what it is that they're sending. Given the fact that 5G is able to transfer significantly higher levels of data quicker, um, you know, potentially more reliably, um, can you foresee any other big use cases that are limited at the moment from 4G that will be resolved by the emergence of 5G more into IoT rather than just the phones as we see it today? Yeah, so the... I think that you, you, you know, what we're starting to see, right, is just more applications that, that consume more data, and it's hard to, and that's kind of a generic answer, right? Uh, but mm. I, I, it's it, it's kind of it's sort of hard to predict, is what we found. Um, yeah, you know, no one would have predicted, for example, um, you know, micro mobility, you know, kind of coming on in, in e bikes in the way that they they did, right? And so you, you start to see. You know, I'm particularly intrigued what will happen is, is you start to see the ability for people to create devices that have much higher data throughput, um, you know, much better latency um, that, that's similar to Wi-Fi. Um, and then you combine that with some other nascent technologies like AI and so on. Uh, and so, you know, I, I don't know specifically, um, you know, off the top of my head, exactly which devices or what, which applications, you know, are going to benefit from it. But I suspect that folks will find more and more ways to utilize um, their devices uh, as it becomes more accessible to push higher mm. data loads. I mean, you know, one, one thing we saw in the micro mobility space is is there was you know definitely an appetite for folks to you know do things like put put you know more put like a dash cam you know on there, for example, which is very very high data usage uh, over mm. time, right? And so. That's just like a good example of like there are, there are business challenges um, that people with devices are facing, and sometimes they're limiting data because they just don't have the right you know it, it's just they, they can't access um, a five G network or they can't access that sort of data throughput. Um, and so I think that you know you can get richer applications, richer data sets, you know, um, smarter devices um, as you start to, it just generally speaking, as you start to be able to pass more data um, with more reliability and more speed. Um, I do think that LTE though is, you know, just 4G um, is suitable um, for the vast majority of applications at this stage, at least. Um, there, there's, there, you know, we have, we've yet to encounter, we've encountered very few, if any, applications that can't run on 4G um, and need 5G. Um, that being said, I think there are ones that would be more optimally run on 5G, and they, and that would be much better to for um, that would be much better for for the the operator. So so I guess it's a long long winded way of saying like I don't I think that the I think that we can't really predict what's going to happen, but I think it'll be good. Mm. <laughs> No, I, I, I get it. I, it was a million dollar question that I asked you, right? and I think you answered it really well. But I think. Uh, I, I think reading between the lines, you know, you know what you're saying, and from your experience, is it the enrichment of the data? So, for instance, uh, if it's video, is it higher quality video? Is it quicker? Is it lower latency? Uh, Micro mobility, is it mapping? Is it more in depth mapping because the ability for five G to, to to transfer more real time updates, perhaps traffic information on micro mobility things that perhaps are constrained by 4g but but it's interesting you should say and, and 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 it kind of raised my eyebrow actually when you said that that there's not uh uh there's quite a lot you can do with 4g as it stands right so what would be the added advantage of 5g but i guess we're we're also a, a you know in ourselves we're kind of victims of our own parameters which we put ourselves in right because we've always kind of developed with this kind of 3g 4g kind of low data uh, mentality um it's quite difficult actually to really think about well wait actually we've now got the capabilities of 5g so we can do a lot more with this um rather than it just being a pure um enriching exercise i.e sending more sending crisper sending more information so it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds because yeah you're right like micro mobility kind of came from nowhere you know who'd have thought you know that you know everyone would, would love to jump on you know, scooters and e-bikes and various things in cities, you know, certainly over here in Europe, uh, 
is just absolutely prolific. So, um, and I think that's I think that's another thing about what's really just exciting in general about the fast moving nature of IoT and in, in the industry that we're involved in is uh, how wrong or right we could be if we look back on this in two years' time, uh, let alone five years' time. So it'll be interesting interesting to see. And, you know, the last thing I'll say on it, right, is, you know, you should have my uh, you know, CTO, co-founder, and Pat uh, on at some point. He can tell you, you know, sort of the spectrum efficiency differences, you know, between 5G and 4G and, and 3G, right? And so there's there starts to be, there, there are, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm underplaying it in the sense that I, I want to emphasize that, you know, you can get a lot done today without using 5G, um, but yeah. there are real reasons um, there are real reasons from spectra, a spectral efficiency point of view why you're going to get way better performance from a 5G point of view and you're going to get better economics from a 5G point of view. And that stuff enables, you know, applications that we wouldn't have necessarily thought of. Um, and to your point, you know, can make, you know, can drive efficiencies for, for new applications or, or if you've got, you know, V2 of an application if V3 is 5G, maybe you can do things that, that you, you never, you know, dreamed possible on 4G, for example. So, 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 you know, don't want to underplay it, but, uh, I think there's, I think there's, uh, there's a lot there. Um, it's a, it's definitely a very interesting topic from a technical point of view. Um, so, you know, I'm, I, I think um, I would yield to, to my, my co-founder Pat on that one though. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, absolutely. It's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting topic, right? Um, moving on back to, well, moving on, and also sort of slightly backwards to the ICM sim roaming capability. I think, I think it's worth exploring that a bit more. So. Obviously, uh, in layman's terms, IoT devices often need to roam across different networks to maintain the connectivity, as we spoke about. Um, how how is uh, an ISIM enabling more seamless data roaming today? Do we have standardization issues, and what other kind of regulatory or technical challenges can you face with this seamless data roaming using ISIMs, Ben? Yeah, so. Uh, the, you know, I kind of split into like two, two or three things. So like, I think the first one is, is the, the device or module itself. Second one is how it's being implemented at the SIM. Uh, and the third one is any sort of certifications that are necessary around networks. So on the device side, you know, that's getting better. Um, especially because, you know, eSIM, iSIM, um, is all, uh, using sort of an EUICC GSMA standard. Um, newer modules, um, that are coming out, um, are all complying with that standard. Um, which means that, um, you know, generally speaking, if we're, we're trying to switch, uh, between profiles, um, it's going to be much more performant. Um, and generally speaking, have a really, really high, you know, really, really high success rate. Um, you know, for, with hologram as part of onboarding, you know, we, we do all that testing up front to make sure it's all, you know, that your device is going to be, uh, suitable. Um, uh, yeah. but generally speaking, if you have a, you have a super old device, it's like, you know, 15 years old or something, it might, it could be challenging. Um, or it could be, or it could work. Um, if you have a newer device, it's highly likely that it's going to work really, really well, just cause it's going to have that standard built in. Um, and when I say newer, I mean like within the last five years or so. Um, and, um, so that's, that's one piece. Um, so devices can, um, can, can be challenging sometimes in that, in that sense. Um, or you might need to write some custom firmware to kind of deal with it. Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, because they're not, certainly not an intractable problem. Um, this, the second one is, uh, around, um, sort of how it's implemented at the SIM level. So, um, you know, you know, if you're, a lot of this depends on who you're working with and how they've actually done the operator integrations. Uh, and, there's a lot of nuance to that, um, as well as sort of any sort of software that's sitting around the SIM itself and that standard. So that standard is almost like, you know, as it stands, is almost like a CD player, right? Like you kind of like pop a SIM in, you pop a profile in, you pop a profile out. Um, and that's, um, and you do that via software and over the air. Um, but it's sort of like one in, one out. Um, what you really want is you want the ability to have like an MP3 player or something, right? Where you can just kind of queue up the network programmatically, mm -hmm. um, build a playlist, uh, or if you will. Uh, and that's, um, a big part of what we've built, um, with our hyper platform is, is the ability for you to sort of, you know, 
optimize between different networks um, and do so in more of a software driven, you know, seamless fashion. So we're taking that standard and then we're taking it one step further. Um, and uh, that is going to give you a lot better performance um, versus just having, you know, to your point around like, you know, a device can't necessarily make a choice around which network to operate on all the time. eSIM or iSIM, you know, in the paradigm for like an iPhone or something, that makes a lot of sense because you where, where you just have sort of the CD player uh, paradigm makes a lot of sense because I am setting up my phone, I'm going to pick an operator. Um, but if you need to switch programmatically on the fly, you need some software around that. So you have more like that mp3 player type of idea. A quick word from today's episode sponsor, Akenza IO. Guys, I speak to a lot of organizations wanting to develop their own smart solutions and the common barriers that keep cropping up is complexity. This is why I'm so behind Akenza IO. Using their no-code self-service platform, companies can build great IoT products with value cases, connecting, controlling, managing, and securing IoT devices all in one place at speed and scale. Their unbiased technology makes it possible to register any type of device via any connectivity technology, process the data and make it available to any application in the cloud. The platform is adapted to organizations of all sizes, from startup to enterprise, from one device to massive IoT deployments. Thanks to the self-service solution, you can start creating your IoT case right away even without coding skills. Akenza IO are offering an exclusive 30-day free trial so you can test the platform out for yourself. Check out the link in the description and start building your smart solution today. Um, and then the third piece is certification. So as you, you know, that, that's this is just general uh, across the board, whether we're talking about eSIM, iSIM, you know, direct carrier, multi-MZ, roaming, whatever. Um, you know, I think it's it's just something that folks need to be aware of, right? Is you know, just whatever operator you're on, um, certain operators are going to require certain certifications, and that's again a completely solvable problem. Something we have a ton of familiarity with, and have a ton of familiarity, you know, walk, walking customers through. Um, but uh, it's just something that you know you, you have to go through to make sure you're compliant. Um, there are definitely folks out there who will uh, underplay that, um, and I think that 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 can be. You know that that can be. Um, I think that that's that's not always the best strategy. Uh, is my point? Of, is my point of view? Mm -hmm. You know, we we always want to make sure that you know people are compliant on on networks. Um, so those are the kind of the three things to think about, especially when you're like switching operators a lot, um, and you're sort of using this eSIM iSIM uh, paradigm. Uh, you know, overall, you know, it, it just requires a little bit of thought. You know, I think as mm -hmm. part of building it, you know. You're, if you're building a connected device, you're doing a pretty complex thing anyways. Um, and so this is just a small piece of it. You know, this is a big part of what we try to make really, really easy for folks. Um, stuff that's on our mind all the time. Um, and um, so I don't think these are intractable problems or challenges by any stretch of imagination. They're just kind of like cost of doing business, normal stuff. Um, yeah. But um, definitely stuff to be aware of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really uh, really good insights, especially around the compliance, as you mentioned as well. Uh, it's really, really important to to do that. You know, it can be a very political situation with this, and, and making sure you get it right from the foot for the first time is really important. Um, touching on satellite versus cellular, I, I guess there's pros and cons for each, depending on an IoT deployment. Uh, is it is it sometimes cost prohibitive to to move towards a satellite model over cellular? Is it, is that why perhaps cellular has uh, has more interest at the moment, Ben, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I think they're complementary, right? Um, you know, same thing, same way I feel about sort of narrowband. Um, it's all complementary stuff. Um, you know, you kind of have narrowband on one spectrum and you have satellite on the other, and then you have, you know, cellular taking the, the big swath in the middle. And there's, of course, Venn diagrams and stuff, but, um, and then some overlap. But really, I think, where, you know, satellite is, you know, narrowband narrow band is going to be terrestrial and it's going to be, um, you know, really like spending tiny packets of data back and forth, uh, low, low power. Um, you know, there's, it's not going to have like a lot of security built around it because it's uh, so lightweight. Um, so there's no, mm -hmm. not necessarily a lot of encryption or anything. Um, but that can be really useful for certain things. If you have like a million, you know, you've got like 10,000 sensors on a farm, you know, you might have a singular, single cellular gateway um, and 10,000 sensors talking to it. It's, it's totally possible. Cellular is, is going to be probably your, your kind of your workhorse, right? Primary backhaul to the internet 
for all devices. Um, it, it really hits the sweet spot between battery consumption, cost, um, both of hardware and of connectivity, um, and just kind of like accessibility in terms of being able to build with it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you can go, you know, three G, four G, and use like a, a you know a lower power um, cellular module, or you can go like you know you can go all the way up to five G, right? And you, you can be you know with a big beefy cellular module. Um, so you have a lot of options uh, there. Um, satellite is going to be stuff where you know you really don't have coverage. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's got big power considerations because you got to stick in a big antenna on there that's going to talk all the way up to space. Um, and, um, it's going to be expensive because there's only so many satellites and, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty limited resource. Um, and so it's expensive from power point of view. It's expensive from a hardware point of view and it's expensive from a connectivity point of view. But, you know, if you need connectivity in, you know, the middle of a rainforest or, uh, or there's a, there's a, a customer we worked with a long time ago, um, that was using satellite, um, that was literally making drones that did security for for gold mines in um, in like Brazil, and so like you know, and they had to wow. worry about like they had to worry about like modern day bandits like essentially raiding these trains, um, you know, like like a like a we- like an old western, except they probably had like Humvees instead of you know horses, <laughs> um, and so they they had to use satellite, and it made sense because you know if you're trying to prevent someone from stealing a bunch of gold off of a train, uh, you know, you're kind of willing to pay whatever. Uh, but, um, but that, that's sort of, those are the key differentiators. Right. And, and maybe over time, you know, people are doing interesting things with some of the uh, low earth orbit satellites and stuff. And so then maybe the costs will come down a little bit, but I still think there's just fundamental physical limitations around, you know, look, you've got to, you've got to get a signal all the way up to space and back. And so there, there's always going to be a, a big power consideration there. Um, um, so, so I think they're all complementary, basically. Long story short. Yeah, I, 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 I find that absolutely fascinating. Uh, fascinating about the uh, the drones and the, and the gold mine. It's just things you would never even think of. Um, I think satellite has its place. You know, I, I was flying across to the east coast recently, and I was able to get full Wi-Fi connectivity on the plane via Viasat. Uh, and it was great, you know, there was hardly any data limitations. You know, I, I thought there'd be a, a fair use policy of, you know, like 500 meg or something, but there wasn't. Um, and I could actually stream video in pretty, pretty good speed, 41,000 feet in the air. And I think probably that's where satellite will remain, you know, in these circumstances where it has to, because cellular just won't reach, or um, there's no plans for cellular to take over or to grow into those areas. Um, and, and, and I think over time, perhaps it will start to disperse and find its own feet longer term in those areas. And that's a really interesting use case, actually, around the, uh, the gold mine, as you say. I, 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 bet, I bet you've got a couple more stories like that, have you? A bit of a, other customers or, or quirky use cases like that. Uh, I guess that's got to be one of the favorites, though, right? Yeah, that's definitely one of the favorites. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. I don't know if I, that's, that's definitely one of the best ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, going on to the value of all of this then, Ben. So uh, in terms of businesses, so you know, really, really quickly, how can a business and a general organization leverage global IoT connectivity to gain a competitive edge, uh, you know, using an eSIM or an iSIM, uh, and, wh- and why w- why would they be interested in doing it in the first place? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, I'm a I'm a, a products guy first and foremost, right? And so, like, I, I think that you know, I would just start with you know, I, I think I would just start with like what you know, what kind of problems can you solve? Um, mm-hmm. And you know, there's you know, I should I should have a better framework for this as we're talking about it, but like. There really are, there's a couple of different categories of problems in my view. Like one is sort of like, I mean, I guess there's really two that come to mind off. Maybe th- I'll say there's three that come to mind off the top of my head. The first yeah. one is sort of like, um, you know, the business intelligence and data collection. So like, what are things about your business that you would love to know, but you just can't understand today for whatever reason? You see this a lot in supply chain, right? You know, hey, I really want to know real time inventory of X, Y, Z thing, or I want to know exactly where this thing is or whatever. Um, you know, that, that's something that 
um, you know, or I really want to know how my customers are using this product um, that is in the field. Um, you know, whether it's a bike or a coffee machine or, you know, a car or whatever, right. You know, what kind of data can I, or, or you know, or a basketball, who knows, right. Uh, you know, how are my customers using this data, using this product? Um, I think that's especially interesting when you combine it with stuff like, you know, when are they going to need to purchase one again, you know, uh, mm-hmm. or, you know, are they going to run out of this thing? Uh, and maybe they're gonna buy something else uh, instead. Um, so I think there's just a broader data collection. And I don't, you know, I think this again, this again, one where like my imagination will fail me. Like I, you know, I'm sure there's someone listening to us who runs a business who's like, Oh yeah, I would really love to know X, Y, Z thing about my business very specifically. But the only way I could do it is if I had a physical sensor on a thing. Um, and that's a great application for, for IOT. Uh, second one um, is going to be anything that kind of requires like command and control. Um, and, mm-hmm. you know, these can be combined, right? So you think about like um, some, we worked with some customers that do like uh, propane tank uh, monitoring, like for um, residential and commercial applications that are like in um, really remote r- rural areas. Um, so, you know, essentially what the business model was prior is they would be sending trucks out there on a schedule. Um, and sometimes they would get there and they wouldn't need propane or anything. Right. Um, and so that's a waste. Um, what they moved to is a model where they now are getting, you know, they're able to, to track exactly how much propane is in each tank. Um, so they've got that sort of data sensing component. Um, and then they're able to take action off that, you know, some sort of command and control action. Right. And so, that can be dispatching, you know, automatically dispatching a truck roll um, to go out there and, and do a thing. Um, you know, in other cases, it can be, you know, you actually want the device itself to do something. Um, you know, I, my, my, my imagination is failing me here, right? But like, you can imagine scenarios where, um, oh, hey, you know, we just received this input. Um, you know, so now the device is going to take X, Y, Z action. Um, yeah. That's, a, that's a, a second great application. The third and last one, uh, would just be around sort of enriching customer experiences. Um, and I think, and just building completely new products, right? Um, we see this a lot in like the telehealth and uh, medical space, right? So, so like hospital at home has been a really interesting one um, where, you know, in the past, you, you know, someone sent, you know, someone goes in the hospital, you know, maybe they have a chronic condition, whatever, they get, um, they get sent home. And then there you have to like kind of follow up the doctor, doctor's calling them. Uh, maybe they have to come in for additional visits. What they're able to do now is, you know, essentially give them a medical device that is going to send all of those readings back to the doctor um, as though they were at the hospital, right? So they mm-hmm. get much richer data sources. And then they're able to have a lot of those conversations with their doctor, you know, via telehealth. Um, so they can, you know, ha- have treatment for chronic conditions with a lot more dignity and a lot more, um, you know, a lot more success, um, while, while the, com- you know, and a lot more comfort from being from home. So, so those are some kind of examples. I would break it down to like three key things. Um, you know, those are the areas that I would look inside your business and say, can I get more data? Is there something that I'm doing today that's pretty manual? That was actually what we did at Food Panda, right? You know, we had, we had a call center. Instead of having a call center, we built a little device. Um, and then the third one is what kind of new customer experiences, you know, can I build? What kind of new products can I enable? that are going to, you know, maybe you know, they're just going to make, make my product better um, and mm-hmm. have more value. And then, you know, presumably you can potentially charge money for them too, which is always great. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, that's, that's, um, uh, those would be my recommendations. Yeah. And, and fantastic recommendations. I think, I think the first and the third could be linked as well. Right. You know, with, with more insights on the data that you collect, you could give a, a different product offering, but you don't necessarily know that unless you've looked at the data. And that's why I think data science is such a, an interesting and, and big uh, proliferation at the moment when it comes to IoT, because uh, the more, the more, the more we have, the more we can understand, the more we can create, the more that we can sell. I love the, I love the example that you gave around connected health. Um, in the past, I, I gave it, um, I gave a talk on connected health, as part of Mencap here in the UK and Vodafone. Uh, they were talking about IoT being an assisted living, right? Being able to, yeah, exactly as you say, be able to get that information straight back to the hospital really, really quickly, and in order to make decisions there and then. Um, can you think about the costs of 
call outs and you know you know whether they need to happen or not at that time so i think some really really you know fantastic examples and and again it never fails to amaze me just how how esoteric and not iot is right so uh on the face of it people think oh it's you know it's a really it's a really small focus area but it isn't it's everything and everything and i think that's a really important thing to understand um but yeah some some fantastic examples there um uh ben i think it's been absolutely fantastic today you 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 speak so passionately about iot and, and i love your journey i love how you've uh come on into this field uh, from from that example that you gave of Food Panda and and been doing such fantastic work, various use cases um, and and to be able to interpret this at, at high level really well is a real skill, right? You know, to be able to do that, it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, as we come to, towards the end of the show, there's always a couple of questions that we we ask our guests, and uh, um, I find this part particularly interesting to to see what people's thoughts are on it. So low pressure. Um, uh predictions for this year obviously we're coming to the end of the first quarter of the year um always an interesting one where where do you think we'll be near the end of the year with iot is there anything that's a kind of dead cert or anything that you believe that will happen that maybe should have happened already oh man uh i asked some tricky questions it's what i do but <laughs> yeah no i i i know i i should have you know man i uh I wish I had a good one for this. You know, I, I don't know. Um, I think my, my predict, look, my prediction and, you know, I'm biased is probably just that you're going to see. Well, okay. So, so my, my, my prediction that, that that's my biased prediction is that you're going to see more and more cellular use cases where you would have otherwise seen Wi Fi. Um, mm. but my other one is I think that you're going to start to see, um, I think by the end of the year, you'll start to see AI. Uh, applications which are you know obviously you know super super hot right now um start mm-hmm. making their way into connected start making their way into connected devices more and more um and i can't really you know i would love to be able to predict what that's going to yield um but um i think that's going to be a bigger part of the iot story moving forward yeah i i, I agree i can't I, I i can't wait to to see that happening ai on the edge um and you know to the arms race that we have with ai at the moment going into the IoT world and in the coalition of those two technologies. I think that's going to be absolutely fascinating. Uh, thank you for that. Really interesting insights. Um, and Ben, we've got a question actually from our audience. Um, and I, I think this is a particularly pertinent one and perhaps hopefully a little bit easier to answer for you, um, being the entrepreneur that you are. Um, what advice, Ben, would you give to entrepreneurs and businesses that are just starting to explore the potential of IoT, having seen the Gartner reports, listened to our show, but don't quite know how to get into it. What, what advice would you give to them? It's a good question. I mean, I, I, I think I will, I will err more on the side of just general entrepreneurship advice, uh, which is, I think, um, just be fully committed. Um, I think the, you know, look, as it relates to IoT, I would say, you know, c- continue to iteratively learn. Um, I think make sure when you're selecting partners that you are selecting partners that understand what it means to work with companies that are smaller and nimble um, versus just, you know, partner, you know, especially, you know, there, there are, there are, there are different companies that are right for different life cycle parts of your, your journey. Right. Um, You know, hologram, we aim to be one that can be part of, you know, your journey from device one to device, you know, 1 million. Right. But there's, um, you know, there's definitely, times to use a certain module that's, that's going to be easier to purchase, you know, at low volume versus going with the ones where, you know, you're not going to get the time of day or good pricing unless you're buying, you know, tens of thousands or, or hundreds of thousands. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, think about it iteratively just as you would anything else, uh, you know, in startups. Um, and I think just be fully in, you know, there's my, my favorite, um, my favorite startup advice is, is a great, Paul Graham article somewhere that was written like, I don't know, maybe like, I think it was written like 2007 or something, but it's, it's called how not to die. And it basically just talks about how startups don't die when they run out of money. They die when the founders stop working on it. You know, they die when, no, oh, you know, I'm going to go back to school part-time while I'm doing this. Um, or, you know, I'm just going to maybe start consulting a little bit on the side. Um, and, um, you know, that is, um, I think that's completely true. You know, if you just, 
have the grit and the perseverance to just keep going, um, good things happen. You stay alive long enough and you start making real money. Uh, and uh, that's uh, my best advice. Yeah, that's really good advice. I guess I, I, I guess it's difficult sometimes for founders, right, given their mercurial nature. Uh, it's difficult sometimes for, for a founder, an entrepreneur, and I'm sure this resonates with you, because to actually go out and do something and actually create something and you're back against the wall requires a special set of skills, right? But equally, the kind of double-edged sword with having that within you is that perhaps you might get bored a bit easily. And and so you've kind of got these juxtaposed forces that play here. Uh, but I think that that's fantastic. And I've, I've written that down as we've been speaking, like How Not to Die by, by Paul Graham, right? I think that's really, really interesting because, uh, yeah, I think you, people need to take their own advice as well and uh, and then they're really see it through. So that, that's great. Um, quick fire round, a couple of questions for you, Ben. Uh, if an actor was to play your life, in a film who would that be and why <laughs> so this is it's just like someone who like looks like me maybe or or like no, so so it's so uh, so so this is the story of you ben forgan this is your life this is your biopic which which actor would it be that would play it and why would they play that role oh jeez i uh, uh this is going to sound totally um self congratulatory or whatever but i think i think i think that if that i think that um uh well no maybe it's too old now but i think i think if i i think the like i think javier bardem would would be a good fit for me okay. when i get really tan when i get really tan you know um yeah yeah you know but um but that's you know that's it I, that's just my own sort of like i i feel like i feel like, yeah, I, feel like I feel like uh i try to you know, embody that that vibe sometimes uh, of just, okay. You know, being cool like Javier Bardem. Uh, so, like that's the one I'll pick. Depends, it depends um, what film he's in as well, right? <laughs> yes, it's true. Maybe, uh, maybe not. No Country for Old Men, even though that's a great. Movie. I was thinking that. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> maybe more like, um, yeah. I don't, I don't know, man. So, uh, yeah. Truthfully, yeah. this is uh, these are these are uh, these are yeah. I feel. I feel. Uh, uh, it's a, you know, it's a cool vulnerable answer. answering this question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's 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 a it's a it's a cool question. It's a cool it's a cool answer to a cool well to why well, I like to think a cool question. Um, <laughs> um, biggest tech fail that you've ever seen. So you know something that's been heralded as as a massive potential success. It's going to change the world, but didn't actually manage to do it. Oh geez, um, I don't know. You know, I, I think that most of these, I think that most of these things actually do ultimately end up, you know, changing the world in some way, shape, or form in their in their own way. Um, you know, I think the one that, like, you know, I think the one that the people would say, yeah, I don't know. You know, I, I everything. I think. I think. Sometimes these things manifest in ways that are different than the way people thought they would be, right? Everything um, happens for a reason, right? Yeah. And so, like, so in that sense, you know, folks might, I, I think, I don't know, so far, augmented reality is probably the, the biggest one that I would point to. That's sort of like people, yeah, if I, now that I'm like kind of thinking about it, so far, augmented reality is, but again, right, it, it, you know, there are applications out there that, that really make sense. And, you know, it's, again, one of those things where it's like, it's hard to tell where technologies are on their curve of sort of adoption. Um, AI is actually a great example of this too, right? Where like everyone's been talking about machine learning and AI and so on and so forth. But um, now you're just kind of seeing, you know, presumably it's hitting this sort of S curve or, or sorry, this, uh, this sort of bent the elbow in the exponential curve, right? The same may be true for something like VR, augmented reality, where, you know, applications may become far more widespread than just like gaming or whatever, um, yeah. as the computing power catches up or as the hardware catches up or whatever. So, so, but so far, uh, yeah, if I had to pick one, that would be it. All right. Fantastic. Um, and lastly, favorite tech entrepreneur? Um. Uh, 
I don't know. I don't know if I have one. Um, at least not one readily available. I've always. Who have you admired the most? So, you know, I, you know, I try to draw from a lot of sources, right? Um, and so I don't think there's any one person that I've ever looked at and I've been like, yeah, like I, I want to be like exactly like that person. Um, you know, maybe, it, you know, it, you know, I think that, I think that for me, it's always been about taking, you know, the best pieces of a lot of different folks, right? So, um, you know, I've always really liked the idea. I guess actually, you know what? I'll say, I'll say Naval Ravikant. Um, you know, would okay. probably, yeah, would probably be the, the person that I, I admire the most in in tech from from uh, his um, uh, you know his sort of like philosopher um, you know entrepreneur style uh, resonates a lot with me. Um, nice. And you know, there's a lot of people in and around sort of that discussion um, that I also really admire. I also just admire people with like grit, you know, who just kind of get it done. Um, and there's some interesting juxtaposition of ideas there around like, um, around sort of, you know, being really, really efficient versus just working really, really hard or, you know, being high leverage versus just sort of, you know, getting things done. Um, Patrick Collison of, of Stripe as well, um, you know, mm. is, is re really, really thoughtful entrepreneur, I think, uh, from what I can tell. Mm. Um, so, so those are, those, are, those would be probably the, the two that come to mind most immediately. Um, and, um, but yeah, you know, look, you know, pull things from, you, know, you read someone, you read a tweet from someone and, you know, or you read a Paul Graham article and, you know, 10 years ago and it ends up being really, really important. So I, I, I don't yeah. think there's any one person that I, uh, really have tried to model myself after. I just try to learn, learn as much as I can from people who are, you know, doing it better. Yeah. Excellent. What, what a, what a lovely way to put it. Uh, ben, it's been absolutely fantastic having you on the show today. Thank you, thank you so much for all your insights and for telling us more about Hologram. Uh, great business. Uh, where can people find out more about that? Um, socials, LinkedIn, Instagram, perhaps other places? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, we're on all the, the platforms. I mean, hologram.io is our website. Um, and, um, you know, all of our our, so, our social is uh, at hologram. Um, the or that's twitter uh and linkedin you know you can just find us on linkedin hologram uh and yeah that's pretty much that's pretty much it you know we're we're around don't be don't be shy if you're building a device we're happy to help <laughs> <laughs> all right fantastic ben thank you very much for coming on to the iot podcast show yeah thanks for having me it's been really really fun Before we go, I wanted to thank today's episode sponsor, Akenza IO. Don't forget to check out the link in the description and gain access to a 30 day free trial of their self service platform. Thanks for tuning in to the IoT podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you're on. See you next week for more IoT talks and tales.